change, LGBTQIA plus perspectives on the switch. Now, before we begin this evening's event, I want to talk about acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. The Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and recognising their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to the elders of the community and extend my recognition to their ancestors who have passed and extend that respect to any First Nations people who may be here with us today. We acknowledge that we are meeting on stolen land and Aboriginal sovereignty has not ceded. So, with regards to Out for Australia, we're an organisation that provides role models, mentors, events, and support to aspiring LGBTQIA plus professionals. And my name is Ken, and I will be the host of tonight's event. Now, with regards to this event, <coughs> this evening's event is all about inspiring people to make the leap to follow their passions. If you're feeling particularly bored, uninspired, generally exhausted, it might be time to consider whether what you're doing right now is fulfilling. I also want to acknowledge that during this particular period, given with what's going on with COVID, it's not easy for everyone to consider making a career change. There are many of us who are unable to make this leap due to circumstances right now. So with that in mind, I just want to make it clear that tonight's event we do not aim to be insensitive to anyone who's not able to make that transition given their circumstances. We're hoping that we can provide awareness on how people can feel about testing the waters for a career change, knowing how to handle ourselves if worst case scenarios were to occur and we weren't able to find a successful situation where we'd made that transition, but still managing regardless. Also, what it feels like to make a successful career transition and also to hear more about the sorts of questions and topics that generally get asked when considering a career change. So to give you a bit of a background as to my career change journey, I was originally a marketing manager for a small startup that was selling living aids for people who lived with chronic conditions. And I found myself really bored and frustrated and I wasn't doing what I enjoyed. And after a bit of soul searching and thinking, I eventually found myself now in my current profession as a relationship coach for gay men, helping men to create loyal and loving relationships by overcoming past dating and relationship experiences, whilst also using communication and self-esteem techniques to get them the relationships that they're looking for. Now, to start off tonight's evening, I want to hand over to Danny Meltzer, who is a person considering thoughts with regards to a career change with her current job. So Danny, just to start off with, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Danny Meltzer. I currently am working in the consulting industry. Um, I work in the forensic financial crime space um, which kind of looks at anti-money la laundering and counter-terrorism financing um, and I've only actually been there for a few months I'm working on a current six month secondment um, and previously I have worked I've worked in the same company it's a, a big four con consulting firm um, and so previously I was working in sustain the sustainability space um, in relation to um, you know, companies and how they report on how they impact the environment. And before that, I worked in financial statement audit. Um, and that was pretty much for three years, which has been the longest um, kind of position I've held in my career so far. Yeah. That's quite an impressive career in that you've gone through quite a lot of jobs, which traditionally are uh, held up by a lot of people as being pillars of when you've made it in the sense that being part of a consultancy firm, for instance, you know, being part of the big four is considered as a big deal for a lot of people, especially aspiring graduates. So why are you considering a career change? Um, it's actually funny you mentioned that because I like that I've already made so many changes because I think it um, kind of shows that I'm, you know, I'm kind of trying to figure out what I want to do and I, I have been testing the waters. Um, but so pretty much my career change or my desire to, 
changed careers is very um, closely entwined with um, my transgender journey, actually. Um, so just a, a quick like light speed um, journey through kind of the, the first 25 years of my life where um, I kind of always felt something wasn't right. Um, you know, like I wasn't living my own life and I was doing things um, based on the expectation of other people, particularly my parents. Um, and I know that's, you know, those feelings and um, experiences aren't um, exclusive to, you know, a trans experience. But um, yeah, that was how I felt. And particularly in the community I grew up in, um, there was a very strong expectation to um, undertake a, you know, a, a Korean accounting or finance. Um, so kind of growing up, that's what I thought I should be doing. And I, you know, I, I, I left school, started uni, um, I studied commerce arts. Um, and I think just looking back on it, the, you know, I wanted to do commerce because, you know, that was going to be the boring degree that, you know, gets me a, a safe job. Um, and then the arts part was kind of just to, you know, for my own interest and to, you know, help me enjoy my time at uni a bit more. Um, but looking back now, it, it kind of seems to me that there was that part of me that um, was trying, doing the arts was that kind of rebellious part of me that wanted to, um, you know, was telling my telling me, okay, maybe you shouldn't be doing commerce, but I, you know, I didn't want to take any risks. So that was kind of a compromise for me. Um, so I only, so I, get, I got to the age of 25 and that's when I, you know, I was still studying. It was my final year of study. And I realized at that point in that year that I was transgender. Um, so it was quite late in life for me. I'm 29 at the moment. And it was actually just before I started full-time work. Um, but I, I went into this kind of job um, as an auditor, which is like extremely dry. Um, and I found that as I've, you know, been on this journey, um, and I'm kind of, you know, figuring myself out more and trying to, you know, find the life that's true for me. Um, I found that being in a in this like consulting space and being, um, in a, in a corporate, corporate environment is kind of, that has come to be standing my way to living a life that's true to me. Um, so I've always kind of, you know, ever since I started out um, in this as an auditor, um, I always found it unfulfilling and I always, I really lacked motivation for the work I was doing, but I tried really, really, really hard um, to enjoy it and to find meaning in it and to be motivated for it and um, it, yeah, it was kind of like, I almost accepted that, you know, this is what my life's gonna be like, where I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to make it work. Um, and then I think this, like in the last few months, really, um, maybe even COVID could have brought it on, just that kind of introspection that it um, encouraged. But I found, like, I, I realized I had to start, like, if, I wanted to find some space to you know, really figure out what I wanted to do. So I started working part time. And once I, once I started doing that, I kind of started undertaking my own research and just had a bit of space from the exhaustion of working um, in that environment. And I kind of, I had this, um, you know, this kind of a half moment um, in, in June actually where you know, I was always on the fence about what to do um, with my career and I was going through the um, year-end performance review with um, a manager of mine and I just, I looked back on the past year of what I had done at work and, you know, on the face of it is, you know, it was some interesting things, but I just realised like how unfulfilling it was for me and how I just, as hard as I tried, I just didn't enjoy it. Um, and yeah, so I kind of just promised myself within the next maybe six months or a year that I'm going to actually, um, you know, make, make the move and, and leave. Um, and so I want to 
I want to make a, make a change um, and move towards the kind of counseling space. Um, I think it will bring me, you know, I've always been craving fulfillment, I guess. I mean, that's a, you know, a, a pretty common uh, human need, but um, I've been craving like that fulfillment from my work. And, you know, I kind of was at a point where I'm, I was accepting that I wasn't going to get it. Um, before I kind of made this decision. And I think, you know, through my own experiences with therapy and, you know, seeing the impact it can have on people, I think um, being, you know, a counselor in whatever respect will, you know, will be the most rewarding and fitting job for me. Um, yeah. And I mean, when I, even actually when I finished, when I finished high school, and I was kind of deciding what I wanted to do. Psychology was, considered like I did consider it but I, th I just felt it was too risky at the time you know I, I just went along the path of least, the path of least resistance um doing commerce just because you know it's it was safe so um yeah that's um that's pretty much why I want to change careers I mean as you kind of mentioned in your introduction that you know the, the need for fulfillment and enjoying what you do um, is something I've really, I really value. And I'm kind of fortunate enough to, you know, be able to pursue. Yeah, I love that. That was really, really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Danny. Things that stood out okay. to me that too was just that overlap between, you know, identifying yourself within your gender, but also how that started to work on broader aspects mm. of what's fulfilling for you as a person and I think that's so important because as part of self-acceptance I think it's really valuable to not only have an understanding of who we are you know within the people that we like but also understanding what drives us and to hear how you know what you were saying before the rebellious part of you that enjoyed the art side of study versus the safety of an auditing career, you know, and accounting and everything that came with it. I can imagine that's been a complete evolution with regards to where you are right now, where you're looking to go to. So that's amazing. I wish I could ask you a thousand questions, but I'm going to have to ask you one for time's sake. So given everything you've just said, what is um, your biggest concern in regards to making the switch into counseling like what's the biggest challenge you have right now in making that move um the biggest one i think is it's i think it's quite logistical actually because um i want to i've kind of got a plan where i want to find a job in um the industry like the you know psychology therapy therapy slash um you know ngo um industry just using my current skill set so that would probably be in like an accounting or finance role um but i also want to yeah and then i need to you know figure out what like where i'm going to study how i'm going to study what i'm like what uni i'm gonna like i can apply for um and i kind of how to make that work you know am i gonna work full-time and then study at the same time or am I going to work part-time and um, work you know have more time to an effort and like to put the effort into um, studying so kind of I'm in that current um, you know mindset of like investigation and, and research um, and then I guess you know there's always that kind of underlying um, worry about you know it there will be a change in like income and like income potential and you know that it's always at the back of your mind you know is is this leap you know will it be sustainable will it actually be will it actually work like am i glorifying this you know idea or, or this career in my head um and you know if i i started and i put all this i invest all this time and money and effort and then you know, I'm, it's not what, it, you know, what I thought it would be. And, it, you know, I'm back to square one. So um, I think there's just so many 
there's so many competing kind of fears and concerns, but they are like my desire to kind of change and find that fulfilling career just trumps it all. Which I think ultimately is the most important thing because mm. it gives you drive to do what you're doing, the research and looking into it as well. But also hearing you, it sounds like there is definitely a lot of logistical things that you want to think about and also recognising what those worst case fears might actually be too. Danny, thank you so much for sharing that. That was incredible. And speaking of recognising what worst case fears might actually be, this ties on very nicely with Rhiannon's story in terms of her career transition. Before I hand over to Rhiannon, I actually wanted to take this opportunity to mention to everyone who's attending that as a special part of tonight's event, uh, we have actually are uh, offering a free mini workshop, which is being hosted by LGBTQIA plus uh, confidence coach, Matthew Cooksey, who is all about helping young LGBTQIA plus professionals to really align to what their passions are and making sure they have the confidence to pursue it, much like what Danny is doing right now. So if that's of interest to anyone, definitely check it out. It'll be linked in the survey at the end of this event tonight. Moving on to Rhiannon. So as we were saying before, Danny, as she beautifully said, was talking about what could, you know, thinking about worst case scenarios, will it work? What happens if I'm not fulfilled? I understand that perhaps for you, Rhiannon, this isn't, you know, entirely something that you can say from experience, but one fear that did come to pass was the impact of COVID. So I'm really, um, Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about your own experiences. Can you tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you're going through at the moment? Um, yeah, so as you've kind of hinted, um, COVID, COVID has impacted my, my career transition. So um, before COVID, I was working really, really hard to transition into the events industry, which has come to a complete standstill. Um, I think events and travel are going to be two of the last industries to come back from COVID and I don't know if they're going to come back to um, the same and to the same sort of capacity. Um, so that that hit me pretty hard but I think before I get too much into that a bit of a further background so before events um, I was working in a pathology lab um, that's what I studied straight out of high school I, di I didn't know what I wanted to do my favorite subject was science so I did a science degree and I very quickly figured out that it wasn't right for me and I didn't want a science career or I specifically didn't want to work in research and the uni I was at, that was what they pushed. That was the only career path was like, get your honours, do a PhD, be a researcher. And I was like, I, I love science, but that's, that's not me. And so I took a year off, um, got the job in the pathology lab with the idea of sort of like exploring other, other careers in science and, and what I want to do. And I, I got this job and by the end of the year, um, and I remember this came up in my performance review. They were like, oh, you, you took this job because you really wanted to explore science and, and what have you found? And I was like, oh, I don't want to work in science. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I am still, I'm still working there. I, I went back to uni. I didn't know what else I wanted to do. So I was like, I'll, I'll finish this course. Um, I stayed on in that job as a casual. So it's been a great backup job for me. Um, and, and I was really trying to think like, what, what do I want? And all I knew was I really wanted a job that um, helps helps people. I really wanted to make a difference, but I didn't know what skill set I had to do that, um, and I and I couldn't figure it out. And then it was just through a chance connection of a friend of a friend um, who happened to work at a at a not for profit organisation, a youth led one, um, and they were recruiting for a big campaign that they were about to start running. Um, and it was like, it's a huge road trip campaign. They get young people from all over Australia and they, they road trip and they campaign and they meet up in Canberra and they're like, you, you should join our logistics team. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I did. And I loved it. Um, so for me, that was like the sort of first spark of, um, oh, like events management, logistics, these sorts of things. Like I'm, I'm really good at, I really enjoy. And uh, it can still link up with like my, my passion of like, I want a job that helps people. So I sort of slowly finished off uni part-time. I worked with this organization for two and a half years and I continued working at the lab. Um, by the time I finished uni, it was 2016. And I just took six months off and went and traveled and enjoyed myself and came home 
and just kind of I stopped volunteering and I was just working and just enjoying the fact that when I wasn't working my, my spare time was mine and I could go out and party and drink and socialize or do a craft um, and yeah and then I, I enjoyed that for a little bit I moved out of home it was great and then I was like okay like the lab isn't challenging me anymore it was never what I wanted it's time to move out and I started applying um, for a lot of events jobs and I just found I wasn't I wasn't getting anywhere um, the, the the years of experience with this um, not-for-profit weren't really translating into hireable jobs um, so I sort of started looking into what can I do and I decided um, one of the the main thing for getting into events is you need a network and the main way to do that is to volunteer and I'd already done two and a half years volunteering and I didn't really want to do it anymore so I decided instead to go to TAFE um, with the hope that they set you up with work experience and I thought these would be meatier roles of what I can sort of get for myself when you when you sign up to volunteer at a festival you get a free ticket and, and often they just put you on quite easy manual labor jobs and you're not really networking um, so that was last year I did a full year of TAFE um, while I was working and then that's when I also got involved with Out for Australia so I did start volunteering again as an events organizer with Out for Australia and I, I really loved that um, and I think that sort of coincided with me coming to terms with my queerness as well. Like that was quite a personal um, journey. And then, yeah, by November, so the end of last year, I finally got my first, um, it was a casual job in events, uh, working for a town hall and it was so exciting. And then I got another little casual job working for a um, graduation company. And then I was, um, Still doing like I was really getting into volunteering at um, festivals and stuff and building a network, but I was sort of getting jobs off people I'd worked with um, through TAFE, through volunteering at um, work experience I'd done at TAFE. So they'll they'll be, they'll they'll more the roles I sort of wanted. So I was happy to do them unpaid because I was getting the experience I wanted out of them, and it was great. And I went and I did um, a four day camping festival, and um, it was unpaid work, but instead they paid me with um, a traffic management qualification and I was kind of like cool why not now it's an extra skill and I came back from that on the Sunday uh, when restrictions were announced <laughs> and all the jobs I'd had lined up were just gone and it would hit me I think it hit me so much harder because I'd been away camping and I'd been a bit separated from the world and I'd sort of been ignoring COVID for a little bit and then I came home and I was like I've lost, like I'd lost a lot of paid jobs as well. So it was a bit of a financial stress initially. I was like, oh my God, that's a lot of money just canceled. Like, and they're casual, so just lost that money. Um, and yeah, and so that was, that was just stressful. I'm really fortunate that because I was transitioning, I did still have the lab job. So I worked there two days a week and that was enough to guarantee I can at least pay my rent. So I think that really helped me manage the stress of losing my events jobs and it was more just the disappointment because I, I was so excited to be finally progressing and networking and it had been quite a long process it had taken years to finally get a foot in the door and I just felt like it, all that work had had disappeared um, and then I kind of settled in I accepted it I picked up some extra hours at the lab I, I um, taught myself to crochet in my spare time I kind of enjoyed living life a bit slower for a bit because I was non-stop I hadn't had days off in weeks and I would go from one job to the next like work all day at the lab and then do an event in the evening and it was chaotic so I just kind of stopped and, and took a moment to breathe and then I started ticking over like I started being um, trying to encourage myself to be grateful and I just kept reminding myself be like yes it's unfortunate I've lost a lot of the work I had done um, but be grateful I still had the lab job and at least like I'm, I've got an income and I'm paying my bills and then that kind of turned into, is it a good idea to move into events full time? Like if I had been there at my goal when COVID hit, I would have been in a much more stressful situation. Um, and so then I started questioning, is this, is this still the right path? And then I sort of thought, oh, maybe if I just stay working at the lab two days a week forever, then I can still do events. And then, I, but I, I still wasn't happy because I was like, I need, I need to get out of the lab. It's been about seven years now and it's not fulfilling for me. Um, and then 
it was actually just through, I was chatting to a friend who's also was looking to like um, go back to study, change things up. And he said, oh, I'm really looking into data analytics. And it was just a light bulb moment for me. And I was like, I love data. Like, I don't know where that, like, I didn't even know I had that passion, but as soon as he said it, I was like, that sounds like fun. Like I love analyzing things. That's where my passion for science comes from. And I love problem solving. Um, and um, yeah. And then the great thing for me as well is I can still pursue something like data analytics. I have gone, I'm at uni now studying that, um, but I can still take that to events. There's data in events. So I can still one day incorporate that into an events career, but have a little bit more job security. Um, or I can take it without like bypass events. The initial motivation for events was to work for not-for-profit. So I can skip the event side and just go work for a not-for-profit, you know, doing data analytics, or there's just a really broad range of career options in data. And it is also just a high growth area for jobs. So um, I guess having gone from events where just there was no security and when it crashed, it crashed. And I, I know a lot of people who work full-time in events and they're, they're really struggling. Um, whereas I guess data analytics to me, I've gone to the opposite. I'm like, there's a lot of security there. But um, I guess because every organization uses data, there's still a lot of opportunity for me to pursue the work I want by picking where do I want to work? Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, <laughs> what a journey because, you know, you had everything lined up. You had, you know, your science background in the pathology lab. You found that spark for inspiration when you were doing the logistics for an event. But isn't it amazing how listening to you, it was not necessarily the event construction, but actually the logistics that was the real sort of mm -hmm. sign that there was something there that would then spark into what you're potentially going to do going forward into data analytics. And how do you, and so looking back, you know, you were thinking to yourself, was events ultimately the right choice for me? I guess the question you have to ask yourself now is, is data analytics the right choice for you? Yeah, I think there's no one answer. Um, if COVID hadn't, hadn't happened, I wouldn't be doing data right now. I would have continued the path I was on and I think I would have really been enjoying it. So I think it's it's not so much like what, what was the right answer? I feel like life sometimes it kind of like there's no overall guiding architecture and it's like whatever happens, happens and you sort of have to be resilient and responsive. Mm. Um, and I guess that's doing and initially my, my response was I'm not happy in the lab um, this thing's really enjoyable for me so I'm going to pursue that um, and then that didn't work out and so now that's led me to data analytics but like had I not had that conversation with a friend I might have ended up somewhere else again I, I don't know and that might have also been really really good um, so I think it's less about what what happened just happened to work out or like this was the right path but more just like I'm sort of con constantly consciously trying to guide my right, the path that's correct for me. And like, even when I'd sort of taken that break and that pause and was just crafting a lot and just working, I was still like in the back of my mind, consciously ticking over what, what do I want for myself? What, what's fulfilling for me? And like, I was always looking for opportunities. And the reason I so quickly jumped on data um, when someone mentioned it was because I was already looking for that opportunity. I was looking for what's my next thing. Yeah, but even in saying that, it doesn't sound like you're not feeling fulfilled. It doesn't sound like you've reached this point and gone, oh, if only I was still in the pathology lab doing this for X number more years, if only I maintain my science degree for doing this role. It actually sounds like it's been a process of continuous optimization. You're getting, you're feeling more fulfilled with each step that you take. Would that be right? Yeah, and um, I think that's always been really important for me. Um, I'm very much like, it's, it's about the journey, not the end destination. Cause I'm like, I don't want to sort of be like, I'm going to hardcore dedicate the next five years of my life to doing this thing that I really hate. I'm going to be miserable for five years straight. And then at the end of that, I will be happy. Like, I don't think that's how happiness works. I don't think you reach that end point. You're like, great, this is, this is good. I think it's like your day-to-day -day life actually ultimately will be more important for your happiness than, than your sort of your, your goals. Um, and, and making it. And so, um, yeah, for me, it's, it's very important to be regularly fulfilled, even if it's in small ways, even if it's in like 
making sure I'm still connecting with my family and my friends and finding fulfillment in that way. It doesn't have to be in career. Um, and even I guess like now, like I'm studying data and analytics and I'm really enjoying it, but I went in sort of full time. And I was like, yeah, let's smash this out. And I was getting stressed and I wasn't having downtime again. Um, and I guess COVID is stressful. So that was like all building on top of itself. And so I I made the decision to defer one subject. So I've just eased that a little bit so that currently, even though I'm in the process of trying to get into data, I'm still able to enjoy that process because I've I'm doing it at a level that's no longer stressful for me and I can still engage in other hobbies and activities or find time to socialise virtually at the moment because I'm in Melbourne. Um, but yeah, I think that's really important is to make sure the process is still enjoyable for you and that you are enjoying each step, not just where you're trying to end up. I thought that was amazing. Rhiannon, thank you so much for that. All righty, moving on to Ben Tang. So Ben has been very fortunate to have what I would describe based on hearing him, a successful career change, but it doesn't sound like he's regretting his choice at all. And he made this choice, I think a couple of years back. Ben, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And without further ado, Ben, please introduce yourself and tell us what you've done and where you're at now. Well, hello everybody. Um, so yeah, I've, um, I guess I'll take it back to high school. Let's go all the way back to where we first meet our major crossroads. Um, so kind of like thinking back to it, it was like year 12, you're thinking about what your careers are going to be. And at that point, um, my two older sisters had not gone to uni and my brother had taken a gap year and he's only a year older than me. So none of my siblings had gone to uni yet. So naturally I was like, I'm going to go to uni. I'm going to get this and do this first out of the family. And kind of that was one factor. And then the other factor was what do I like to do? I, was really, I really like leadership. I like teaching and working with people. So teaching was one of my considerations. And the other thing I really enjoyed was design and kind of being like from this migrant family was like, how do you explain to your mother that you want to be, a, you want to go into design? Like my Chinese isn't even that good. I don't even know how to say that in Chinese. It'd be all these abstract words I'd be trying to pull. So in the end, I went with teaching, not because it was a fallback or anything, but because of these two paths, they both excited me. They were both things I wanted to do, but teaching was the profession that um, a mother could understand a lot easier. And it wasn't something that was risky or it wasn't something that she needed to be worried about. So I went along with teaching and ended up teaching for about five years in total, but kind of towards the end there, I had kind of seen where my life would go as a teacher. I could kind of see what that looked like in terms of career progression. And I didn't hate the idea, but I guess I still went back to that what if, what if I'd chosen design first? And all those hesitations I had about doing design, like part of it was, oh, I've, you know, all these programs, there are people that are 14 and already know how to use it and I don't even know how to use it. So I had all these like things saying I couldn't do it, but it was really just me that was saying that to myself. And working with students, uh, I kind of saw that there's so much potential and, you know, there's no age where you can be like, I'm not going to be able to do anything. You can always learn. Um, and kind of with that mindset of like, I'm not too old, I started studying part-time. I did some short courses first. Um, Rhiannon, you said you went to TAFE and like that was certainly one of the pathways I chose as well. I did some really like night courses and stuff just to test it out, just to make sure it wasn't like this fluke. It wasn't just like this crazy dream, just to make sure it is something I actually love and something I wanna be doing. And from those short courses, I decided to enroll in a full-time course which thankfully was only um, three days a week. So I could still continue teaching part-time. So for a while there, I was able to balance out these two uh, passions and interests that I had. It was teaching, I get to do that, teaching maths, and I get to do design on, the other, on my other days. Um, and in the end, I was like, all right, if I'm gonna see where design takes me, I need to commit full-time to that. Um, and I've been really lucky and fortunate to work for a company that took me on as a part-timer and then 
moved me to full time and then kind of um, at a certain stage also opened up some other doors in terms of management as well. So I've been really fortunate in that respect and the transition to with career changes, I would definitely say given the time of COVID is that time to reflect and think about things. Um, I think we've all touched on it tonight is um, taking some time off, whether it's going part-time or if it's um, just taking a prolonged period. Like if you just have that time to think and reflect, you can really discover more about yourself and um, kind of go back to basics. I mean, you think of that big period between high school and uni starting, like those three, four months where you just have nothing to do, you kind of really do think about what your career is heading. And working full-time, you get kind of, you just keep going and going, you kind of don't even think about it anymore. Um, but definitely taking that time really gave me perspective and helped me work out my priorities and things that I'm gonna find in fulfillment in, in my day to day. I think that's fantastic, Ben. I mean, it sounds like when you, given your background and even the switch with career and tossing it up in between that, between teaching, design, I can imagine there was a heavy weight of expectations on your shoulders too. And also it wouldn't have been an easy choice under certain circumstances too. Can you share a bit more light into what it was like coming to grips with maybe family expectations and making this choice for yourself into finally going into design, the thing that you said, you know, it was very hard to even translate to your family. Yeah, I think it, in the end, it just took a lot of um, confidence and a lot of faith in what I was doing was that I knew that this is what I really wanted to do. And in a way I'd kind of, proven to my mom and proven to my family that I am capable of this uh, traditional career path um, and that the decision I'm making now isn't one I'm making lightheartedly. It's something that I'm really, really drawn to and it's something that I really want to be doing. Um, and I guess I'm also fortunate in the way that <laughs> my brother went from being a primary school teacher to being um, to going to Bible college to then joining the army. So. <laughs> I guess it kind of runs in the family to be a bit um, experimental or to, <laughs> I guess, jump uh, headfirst into things. And yeah, I think that early conversation as well, establishing my own independence um, was kind of crucial in making these career moves as well, was not feeling like I needed to live my life for my family or for someone else. It was really just for myself. Yeah, and I think that's such a powerful thing to do too. I don't know about you, but one thing that I often hear from people is they have what's called an inner critic, like a voice in their head, which is usually a mum or a dad or even a friend telling them that, you know, uh, you know, what if this doesn't work out? What if you don't make it in this career? What if that, what if another? How did you contend with the self-criticism that might have been going in your own head when presented with this possible opportunity to go into design? Oh, I don't even know. I think <laughs> a lot of it is, um, I think whatever struggles you're going through, I think it's knowing what it's gonna be like on the other end. Mm -hmm. Like taking a pay cut now, but having faith that in the future, um, if money is the thing that's gonna make you happy, having faith that what you're going, what you're doing is going to translate. And that works for, I guess, money comes from also like whatever your measures of success might be, like your own happiness. If you're you know, slogging it now, but you know that you're gonna be happy later on, you know, you have faith in that. So regardless of what goes on, the doubts that other people might have or the doubts that you might have, you kind of focus on that and it really helps, I think. And I just, I've always loved, um, I think Steve Jobs did this like commemoration speech talking about um, being able to connect the dots when you're looking back on your experiences, when you're looking forward, it might be difficult, but just having faith in what you're doing and finding fulfillment in those things, it's, that all comes together in the end. Mm, I agree, I agree. We've heard a lot about fulfillment from Danny, from Rhiannon, Fulfillment is something that I think can be quite nebulous for some people. How would you describe fulfillment? 
Oh, I think I find for I think fulfillment's a balance of not just one factor, it's all your factors together. Kind of like when you if someone's asked you what is love, if you had to break it down, you might say comfort, you might say security, you might say laughter and joy. It's all these smaller things that work together. Um, and I think personally for me, for fulfillment, it's um, excitement in my day to day. It's um, feeling supported. It's, um, I guess, a sense of adventure as well. Um, and I think, yeah, I think for, for me, that's kind of what um, fulfillment can be. I love that. No, I think that's really, really good. And my last question for you, Ben, is to anyone who might be considering a career change, especially with the heavy hand of family expectations, friends, maybe not giving them the right support that they need, what would you tell them about making a career change? My advice to career changes or people considering career change would be to take time um, to reflect and think about what you want. I would also really um, recommend is re-educating, um, doing short courses, studying, I guess, collecting information so you're not diving into the unknown, but also seeing if there is a, a way of, instead of making a switch, doing like a transition, um, like the chance of working part-time so that a lot, you still have a bit of security. Um, I think that's probably what I would best, but I guess that comes from my own experience of having done that as well. Um, some people, you know, really thrive on go being in the deep end. So I think everyone's got their own journey. I don't think you need to feel like you need to prescribe to anything. I think you just need to have faith in yourself and um, believe. I love that. Ben, um, I actually want to share with everyone a little bit about your news tonight because I noticed how happy and bright you are and I want to actually make sure that you can talk to everyone about this. So can you share a little bit about what's been happening for you recently as of today? Yeah, so um, I'm probably a bit bright from the spotlight being on my face, but um, the reason I'm also, I guess, quite giddy and happy is because I've, um, during these times of COVID, um, I've been working three days a week, so I've had those two days off to kind of uh, refine my portfolio and think about what I want to be doing. And for my next stage of my career, um, I've been really wanting to move more into um, animation design as well as still maintaining graphic design. And uh, a role came up and I applied for it. And, you know, having faith in myself was like, it says five years experience, but I don't have that, but I've got all these other transferable skills from teaching, um, applied for it. And I was lucky enough to receive an offer today. Um, and I've put in my resignation at my current place. So kind of onto that next stage of my career, which is really exciting. I love it. Congratulations, Ben. It's so exciting that you've been able to get this because I know from hearing you how much not only you love design, but just how important this next jump for you was with the next job. And I think this is a great point to note that to anyone out there who might be considering a change, especially during this period in time, do not let COVID be a block mentally to trying even whether it be a job application to trying to change what you're doing because opportunities still exist they may not be traditional but as you can hear from ben tonight he's done what might seemingly be impossible so congratulations ben and last but definitely not least matt lewis i'm really keen to have you speak so matt is from rmit university he is a recruiter and Matt, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at RMIT University? Yeah, can do. Thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, so like you said, uh, my name's Matt Lewis. I work at RMIT University um, in recruitment or the talent team, as we like to call ourselves, and we're branded. Um, and my role is essentially recruiting everything other than teachers. So we call them professional roles. So <laughs> it's very broad. Um, but if you're not a teacher, I wouldn't recruit you, but I would recruit everything else that is alongside that or supports teaching, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I've been at RMIT for just under two years now and I've sort of got my own little uh, career sort of change journey as well. I'm not sure if you want me to go into it, Ken, or not, but... Um, Please, go for it. Yeah, I guess similar to, to Ben um, in high school, I sort of um, was a bit unsure what I wanted to do and I did all these courses that were 
more about passion for me and enjoyment, um, but didn't really align to a career specifically, which was interesting. Um, and then I just happened to fall into the banking world. So in the collections space, uh, just call center stuff um, and worked my way up there. Um, and I had a really good experience in being recruited into the bank, which always stuck in my mind. And I wanted to recreate that for people. And it was always niggling away at the, at the back of my mind. Um, but I never got the opportunity or never had the courage in myself to pursue that within the bank that I was at. Um, and then an opportunity presented itself. Um, so I decided to make the leap um, against a lot of people's guidance who said it's probably not the best idea, um, but decided to do it. And I've been in recruitment, yeah, for the past four years. So um, that's my little journey and a bit about me. Beautiful. And in saying that, how do you feel about being in recruitment in spite of what people told you? Yeah, so a lot of people said to me that you can't make a career in recruitment. Um, it's just a lot of sharks, as some people would say. It's just a sales job and that's all. I'm not a salesperson by any means, so that scared me. Um, but there's all different facets to recruitment and it, um, I think helping the people or helping people get jobs is a bit of a passion of mine, just helping people generally. Um, so that's, I guess, what I focused on when all the naysayers were saying, it's not the best idea, you're not going to get a career, you're not going to make any money, um, it's just a sales job, blah, blah, blah. Um, I kept that in my mind and stuck to that. Um, and I'm, yeah, glad I did. Beautiful. Now, Matt, um, just for those who may not know the ins and outs of how RMIT University works and how your role relates to people who are looking to change from one college to another, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we work, I guess, as business partners within the university. So we have a bunch of different colleges that make up the overall uni. It's very large. Um, and we work with the business to, I guess, fill their um, employment gaps. And with working with candidates that are internal, um, if they're wanting to move internal between roles, um, we work with them one-on-one -on -one essentially. So it's all about your transferable skill set. And Ben spoke about this and Randon's touched on it and everyone really has touched on it, but um, working with those candidates who are wanting to move from, let's say, School of Science into College of Business, two totally different colleges, totally different focuses and teachings as well. Um, but guiding them through a process where they can identify what their skill set is, why they're wanting to move. So they're not running away from something, they're running to something that changes the whole perspective of things. Um, and just helping them set small goals that they can hit and achieve to get them to that end goal. So it's a, it's a whole journey. That's a very long way to answer your question. <laughs> um, but that's what we tend to do. And it seems to help a lot of people as well. Um, Cause at that point, with someone, they can be a bit confused about where they're wanting to go and they don't clearly know why they're wanting to move as well. So it's about figuring that out with them too. I can imagine. In your experience, when you are talking with potential candidates or people who are just inquiring, what is the number one thing they're typically asking or inquiring about? Yep, um, great question. Um, and again, this goes back to transferable skills. So they want to move into a space, but they can't see how they can get there and how they can put themselves forward as a potential candidate for an employer or a hiring manager. So it's all about figuring out what transferable skills you have in your job now and what it is that they're wanting in that next job or next area. So my, I guess, tip, I suppose, would go through a position description. All jobs have position descriptions. They have job ads. Go through that and figure out, okay, I've got these skills they're looking for these skills, how do mine relate to that? And you might not be able to see where yours relate straight away, but if you think about it and really break it down, a lot of them are quite transferable. Um, so it's about getting that in your head and clearly seeing that, yes, I have ABCD, they're looking for ABCD. This is how I can go across. Mm, I think that's fantastic. You know, one thing I'm hearing a lot too, and a few people have touched on it tonight as well, is that question, how? How do I go from where I am now to where I want to be? And in my own experience, I find it fascinating how that can be such a mental block because we think to ourselves, well, I don't know how. In your experience, Matt, can you talk a little bit more about how people react when they're actually able to recognize 
that they can do it and that how is not such a big deal for them. Yeah, um, it's a very easy way to answer, but they're very happy because <laughs> um, it's a journey, right? Like I was saying before, you might not be able to see yourself in a role or you might not be able to see the skills in your current work. Um, but when you sit down and think about it and realise, actually, I have done this, this, it might look like this, but it's essentially the same skill and it will actually transfer across. You can realise and you have that aha moment where you can say, I can actually do this. This is how I can do it. This is when I've done it as well. And then you can put forward, I guess, your, your pitch, I suppose, or your, your sales pitch um, for the hiring manager to make them realise and see you in that role. Mm, absolutely. And I understand that obviously recruitment <clears throat> within RMIT University, your role is specifically within the university, but to anyone who's looking for perhaps a career change outside of a university setting, I imagine that what you're talking about, it has still got practical uses for anyone. How would you tell, say, a friend what they would need to do in order to consider a career change outside of, say, RMIT University? Yeah, definitely. Again, I'm going to keep, I'll sound like a parrot, but the transferable skills are really key. Um, but if you're moving to a totally different industry or something, a different role, mentors, are, for me, in my experience, have been the best thing that I've ever engaged with. Um, because you see a person in front of you who has done this, is in this role now, potentially, and they can really outline what you need, the steps you need to take, how to get there. Um, and they can guide you through that process. Um, and I think sort of, yeah, taking the time to research as well. And Ben has mentioned this, everyone's mentioned this, but research where you're wanting to go, look at what it is that they're doing, what it is they want, the skills they want. And again, having to think about how what you've done in the past can translate into that space um, and then sort of go from there. And obviously it's not going to happen overnight. Um, sometimes you need to set small goals, take it day by day. And then you'll get there in the end. And it's about accepting that and backing yourself as well. Um, I'm a person who doesn't really back myself a lot. And that's been a big journey for me. Um, but backing yourself, yeah, really helps. I agree with that. Mm. I agree with that. And one final question for you, Matt. In your opinion, do you think that COVID is really a barrier to stopping people from changing careers? In, in some ways, I think realistically it can be. Um, but I also don't think it is. Um, so uh, as Ben mentioned before, and sort of Rhiannon's done, it's it's given people an opportunity to sit back, take a breather, have a think about what it is they want to do. Everything falls down to your passion, um, I think. And a lot of people are realising that now and they've got the time to map out how they're going to move to industry A to industry B and have a think about what it is that they need, whether it's upskilling, it's short courses, it's finding a mentor, it's volunteering, just keeping an eye and, and talking to people. Um, yeah, uh, I think there's obviously pros and cons to it, um, but I don't think it's a, it's a stop dead roadblock. There's ways around that. Fantastic. I think that's actually, you know, what people, like I said at the beginning of this event, I don't necessarily want people to feel incensed that we're saying to them that, you know, you can do it against whatever their circumstances might be, because as you're saying too, baby steps, there, there's no easy way to get to where we want to be overnight. These are things that need to be thought about, you know, over time and they will happen over time. And I really appreciate that answer because I think that's a very sensitive way of just appreciating that given some circumstances, it may not be possible right now, but for those that definitely are inspired by tonight's event, they shouldn't allow COVID to necessarily keep them in a position if they're especially not happy with what they're doing right now. At this time, I would like to open this up for five minutes of Q&A, but I'm going to be naughty and do my own question to Danny because Danny, obviously, as someone who is in the position of perhaps many of the people who are listening to this tonight, how do you feel now about listening to some of the roadmaps that people have been setting forth and what they've gone through? Um, I actually, what Ben said really um, spoke to me about kind of making the, the switch more of a transition than a jump. Um, and how he mentioned like going, using, um, doing short courses just to kind of dip your toes in and see if it actually um, you know, works for you. Because 
I think I've gone along with a mindset that, you know, I'm like, I'm so sick of my job. There's like a lot of resentment there. And, you know, it's kind of something that's been bubbling up under the surface for such a long time. And I just want to leap out the water and, you know, like free willy over. And um, I kind of, yeah, it's like I, I can be quite stubborn in the fact that, you know, like this is what I'm going to do and I'm just going to go straight in there. And, you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, there was, um, there was that like fear of, you know, what if it's not what it turns out to be and I'm, um, you know, I'm back to square one. Um, so I think that's actually a really um, valuable takeaway because, you know, I am working part-time at the moment, so I can, you know, I do have the capacity to, you know, maybe look at some short courses and um, enroll and, you know, just speak to people. And also what Matt mentioned about um, a mentor. Um, yeah, I'm really kind of, I've just already started racking my brain about people that I can reach out to and speak to a, um, to kind of, you know, see what their experiences are, experiences like, you know, maybe see what their kind of roadmap has been as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, this is, been a, a very valuable uh, hour for me. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, look, just to everyone here, thank you, Danny, for your thoughts on that too. Thank you, everyone, from the amazing panellists here tonight, as well as to those that were listening to this event, because this has been something of a bit of a passion project of mine alongside my own career transition too. And I hope that it's given you a real appreciation of what you want to get out of life too. With regards to further information, um, Ben, I believe you mentioned that you've written an article on career change. Is that right? Oh, Ken, I just said that to you privately as like, a, I thought you might be interested. <laughs> you should probably share that if you wanted to like talk about that, but other one people who might be in the journey as well. No, it was just, it's just a really short, like, you might even just say it's an extended post that I made on LinkedIn about, um, I guess, be modest, ben. about going from teaching to design. <laughs> Sorry to put the spotlight on you about that one, Ben, but I just thought I might share that in case people were also interested in that too. Thank you for sharing that though. Uh, with regards to mentoring, as people may or may not know, App Australia offers mentoring for a lot of people under various careers and if you're looking for inspiration based on tonight's event please check out Mentor Loop because it's a fantastic asset to really getting an understanding as to the people who have gone to where you want to be and getting a roadmap and a better understanding as to how you can make that possible for yourself but other than that I just want to say thank you very much everyone who's attended this event thank you Ben, Rhiannon, Matt and Danny for your involvement tonight and everyone else who was involved with this event and we hope that everyone is staying safe and we look forward to the next Africa Australia event. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.